Good afternoon. My name is Joel Swanson. I'm the director of the TAM program here at Atlas. Um, welcome to this afternoon's Atlas Speaker Series, where we bring in artists, technologists, designers, thinkers, and leaders who are doing interesting things with technology. Uh, we are grateful to Adit Harrell Caperton and Anat Harrell, whose generous funding supports the Speaker Series. And we also have uh, flyers for upcoming speakers and a email sign-up sheet is going around if you'd like to join our email list so we can contact you with future events and speakers. Today's speaker is Jur Thorpe, a data artist whose work makes data meaningful. Uh, he makes visualizations that help us make sense out of the data that saturates our world. He joins us from NYU where he is an adjunct professor in the Interactive Telecommunications Program. He has a background in genetics but worked as a flash programmer Remember Flash? Yeah. Uh, and, and a web developer before he turned towards data visualization. His work has been published and exhibited in numerous places, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and at the 9-11 Memorial in New York, where he worked on an algorithm that laid out the uh, names of the deceased in a contextualized, meaningful way, rather than alphabetically. From 2010 to 2012, Jure was the data, data artist in residence at the New York Times, where he worked on numerous projects, including Open Paths, a project that lets people track their locations and visualize their movements. And it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Jure Thorpe. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I had kind of a, it's been a strange day. I flew into Denver this morning and I arrived at the car rental place only to find out that my license had expired six months earlier. <laughs> and then I, I, I got back to the airport only to realize that I'd left my computer at the car rental place. And then I got back to the airport only to realize that I'd just missed the bus by one minute. And then I waited for the next bus and realized that they only take exact change and I was a dollar short. And out of the 18 people in the lineup, only one of them was willing to give me a dollar. So I want to dedicate this talk to the guy that gave me a dollar to get to Boulder. Um, I, feel, I feel like I am in your debt somehow, since I don't know, since I don't know his name. Um, this talk is, is not, I, we lured, I, I think I lured you here in some way uh, to promising a talk about data visualization. This is not really a talk about data visualization. There's, there's data visualization in this talk. This is like a talk about data visualization the same way like E.T. was a movie about an alien. You know, There's an alien in the movie, but it's not a movie about an alien. It's a movie about humans and friendship and the Reagan era, era USA. And uh, so, so I want to use the work that I do as a framework to talk about something which is happening with our, with our society right now around data this new conversation that's happening around it, which I think in many ways is, is, is running off the rails in, in some, some wild directions. Uh, this is a story that appeared in the New York Times, actually, uh, in September, and it still bugs me. Uh, so this is the, the, the headline of the story published on September 25th, an elite public school is the saddest spot in Manhattan, a study says. This is a typical of the type of stories that we see generated from data. So there's researchers somewhere, I don't know where this particular researcher was, who had done this project using Twitter data, and he had determined that the saddest location in New York City was this um, school called Hunter College. It's, it's, uh, um, it's a high school. So, so uh, imagine just for a second what it would have been like to be at Hunter College. And this story comes out in, in uh, the New York Times saying that you're the saddest place in New York City. Right, first of all, like, imagine what that would be like with all your friends from other schools. But then like, imagine what it would be like if you actually kind of were a sad kid at Hunter College. And, 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 and um, this is the map that they produced. Hunter College is one of these pink spots. It's this, I think it's this one down at the bottom. Um, and what it turned out, however, uh, it took two weeks for a reporter to ask um, the researcher, hey, why is Hunter College the saddest place in New York City? And when, and when the researcher went back to their data, he, they realized they'd made a mistake. And uh, first of all, I, the location was geotagged wrong. So, so they had the tweets that were geotagged as if they were in Hunter College when exactly, actually it was like one person who lived in the neighborhood of Hunter College, but it, did, it wasn't actually Hunter College itself. The second thing is like, I think, I mean, the academics in the room are hopefully understanding that if, <laughs> 
if a few tweets um, so from some guy a few blocks away from Hunter College could pollute your findings this badly, then maybe you have to take a look at your methods. And, and I think the large amount of the blame though lies in the journalists for so avidly jumping on this story and deciding that um, they were going to write it, and it took them almost a month to write the correction, <laughs> which I'm sure uh, was great for all the parents who had spent three weeks um, wondering whether they should move their kid out of Hunter College or not. Um, so, so in this case, we have we have a, a measurement of a system. We have Twitter, which is like the, a, a a thing that these researchers were using to measure the sadness in New York City, and and this is what happens when we work with data. Right? When we're working with data, we're never working with the thing. We're working with the measurement of a thing, and that measurement contains all kinds of different biases, all kinds of different errors, all kinds of different mistakes, and I think you know all kinds of different beauty, all kinds of poetics. And, and, and I want to, um, I want to sort of walk through, I think, how we got to this spot and then, and then talk a little bit about how we can get out of it. So my favorite, um, definition for, for data is that data are measurements of something. Really simple definition, but actually carries a lot inside of it. Because we have this active measurement, this human active measurement, and then we have this real world system, which is the something. So kind of encapsulated in this are almost all the things you need to know about working well with data. You have to understand that, you know, these are measurements that were made by a human in some fashion, and that they're not the thing, and that there's a real world system somewhere that these, um, that these data came from. But let's start in space, because I like space, and Boulder likes space, and um, uh, it's a good place to start. So this is, uh, so this is a, an amazing mustache, you have to agree, right? <laughs> <clears throat> this is Johannes Kepler, he's uh, history's perhaps most famous astronomer. Um, and, and most of us, I think, know his name recently because of a project that NASA ran for a few years called the Kepler Project, Kepler Telescope, which was um, shining or, or looking out into the stars, and it was looking for distant planets, which is pretty exciting science. I, I am a, I'm a kind of broad uh, science geek, and I, I got really excited about, about this project, and I, I, I read a lot about it and, and went and met some of the scientists that worked on it. So. Kepler is looking at this region of space. Is it possible to get the house lights down in here? Um, just because it'll all look much prettier. Uh, so this is Cygnus Lyra. It's a, space, a region of space that's about the size of your outstretched hand against the night sky. It's a very dense area of stars, and Kepler is focused right on that region of stars. And what it's doing is it's sending back these gigantic photographs. And so these are huge, huge, high um, density, high resolution. Um, we can think of them as photographs. And if we zoom in, we see that indeed um, it's full of stars. And what, what the scientists in the Kepler project are looking at is they're looking at each of those points of light as a, as a place that they can make measurements. And what they're looking for on those points of light is they're looking for the points of lights to dim a little bit when a planet comes between us and the star. So, you know, so far away. Such a tiny planet coming in front of that star, and they're going to look for that dimming of that of that star, and that's going to tell them with some degree of confidence that that um, there's a planet out there. So, NASA, you know, has something that I don't have, which is the world's seventh largest supercomputer. This is called um, Pleiades. It's the computer that they use to crunch the um, big, huge fire hose of data that's coming down from from Kepler, and, but the result of it is quite, you know, quite elegant. These, these charts that show these dips in light that are periodic um, when the planet comes between us and that star. So fascinating to me that we can do this, right? Put a telescope in space, first of all, that's a hard thing. You know, I, and then imagine like, keeping that telescope so steady in, and, and, and having it so accurate that you could look at each individual star and get these really clean um, things out of it, and then having the science that's good enough to say, Hey, I, I can say with a good enough degree of confidence that this is a planet. I know how big it is. I know how often it orbits its star. I know what its temperature is. I can find out something maybe about the composition of the planet as well. And, and I think this type of thing, so, so as an aside, um, this, is, this number hasn't hit its peak, but the, the Kepler project at the time when I put this slide together had found 3,411 of these, of these exoplanets. Um, so I built the visualization of this system when I was trying to understand it. This is every, pro every um, planet that the Kepler project had found about a year before that as if they were orbiting around a single star. So you can see most of them are very close to the star. Uh, the red ones are the hot ones, so they're very hot, not surprisingly. I'm going to start them here by temperature so that you can see that kind of cone of, of, of heat that comes as they come near their star. 
Um, but we can see from this plot, this, see, that's Earth way over there on the right-hand side. So almost all of these planets are, are much closer to their star than Earth. They're much bigger, and they're much hotter. And, and that's not a surprise to anybody who works on this kind of thing. But actually, when I read the paper the first time, I didn't really get this right away. And so by putting the data into this visualization, I got it right away. And it was a, a, a really fun exercise um, for me and, and, uh, and really helped me learn and understand the system a little bit better. So a couple of years ago, I uh, we get the volume down a little bit. Maybe I can do it here. There we go. Uh, so a couple of years later, I worked uh, with a company in California called Oblong to build this, which is an interactive tool that allows us to explore the same system. I thought, you know, space, is, space data is a good data to do some futuristic things with it. And so Oblong is a company that was started by this guy named John Underkoffler. John is, uh, was the motion designer for Minority Report. So I should say the conceptual designer for Minority Report. He was at MIT at the time, and they came to him and asked, what would an interface of the future look like? And so... Um, more than a decade later, we have this working version of the Minority Report interface that allows us to do some pretty interesting things with data that we would not normally be able to do. And, and, and for me, as somebody who works with data all the time, this was really exciting for a couple of reasons. First of all, the biggest problem we have as data visualizers is at, with, on, with big data is something called overplotting. It means that there's too much stuff to fit on the screen. And when the screen gets bigger, we, we have a lot less problem with, with overplotting. And then what I like best about this um, project, it was an experiment to see whether I could build something that engaged with data with no on-screen interface. So there's nothing on the, on the screen except for the data. All of the interface is, is, is built into the body. So we can work with this data without drop-down menus, without all this, these kind of um, things that, that, that have, I think, been built because of the limitations of our computing systems and not because of any requirement for them. I wanted to show this project first, though, because it provides us a really good model for what is happening with data. First of all, our ability to measure things is getting much, 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 much more precise. We can make smaller measurements than we could ever make before. Second of all, our computation, our ability to compute on that data is getting much, much better. So um, this is a passage by uh, Neil Stevenson from a book called Cryptonomicon, which um, some of you may have read. And I'm not going to read it for you because it's small type and I don't want to read the whole thing. But it's a, 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 a mind uh, experiment here that says, imagine that we took everybody in the city of London and um, we put a, 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 flat, a light bulb on their head so that as they walked through the streets and went down onto a curb and up onto another curb and down onto the curb and down onto the, up on the other curb, we would get a line that would indicate nothing except for their kind of elevation change as they walked through the city. So a light bulb on the head, we can measure that um, elevation change. A really simple measurement, but the ability to do that kind of measurement is, is the first step in the process. Now we can imagine if instead of just one of those lines, we had hundreds and thousands of those lines. Let's imagine that we had all of the people in London, or at least a large enough subset of the people in London, wearing these light bulb hats, and they were recording nothing, again, nothing but the, the elevation change as they moved through the city. So the premise of this um, Neil Stevenson uh, story, this particular piece of the story, is that if you had smart enough people and you gave them nothing but these lines, nothing but these lines, they could walk out of a closed room eventually with an accurate map of London, having never seen the city before. Now the idea here, this is what we're doing. This is what the scientists in the Kepler project are doing. They're taking these measurements and they're putting them together to allow us to see things that, that we've never been able to see before. And, and I think that um, the quote that, that Neil Stevenson uses in, in, as part of this, it, it gives us a really good way to think uh, about, about what, where we're going and, and I think where the possibilities lie. He says that, um, there's, I apologize for the gendering of the language here, but it, this is the quote. It says, but if he had depth and in ingenuity, it would be a different matter. Depth and ingenuity, enough data, and a cleverness to understand what to do with it. Um, 
So speaking of clever, this is uh, one of my favorite scientists, um, Lashlo Barabashi. He's a network scientist who works at Northeastern University. And a few years back, um, we worked together on a project for Wired Magazine in the UK, looking at, this is so similar to what we're talking about, looking at um, how we could take the trails of people's mobile phone devices and, and, and understand things about how humans travel. It's, it's a region of science called um, human mobility science. And, and so what we're seeing here actually is not at all mobility yet, but this is a chart that shows um, all of the people that we had access to in this data set and how many phone calls they made during the period. So this person over here makes the most. That person over there doesn't talk at all on their phone. Uh, this person, by the way, they talk 84 hours a week on their phone. I think we all know some of these people. I was on the bus with one of them this afternoon. Uh, this is a great graphic, but it, 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 um, for me, it's a great graphic, but for my editor, not so much. And so I want to talk a little bit as well uh, as I'm going along here about the practice of, of building data visualization. So one of my central tenets in, in working with data visualizations is something that I call the OOA principle, which is that um, for a visualization to work, it needs to carry enough OOA that somebody who wouldn't normally be interested in it will be interested in it. And it has to carry enough AH that you're going to learn something that you didn't know before. And I think that a lot of people, um, um, we, we, everybody makes mistakes in one direction. We can kind of see this thing, the fulcrum changes depending on, on where you're publishing. But I think we can always agree that every day, every day to visualize, they just should have at least a little bit of ooh so that it doesn't just attract a really super limited audience. And it should have a little, a, at least a little bit of, of ah. So um, I decided to take those graphs and do the ooh side with them. So I built these kind of stylized cell phone towers out of the data. These are the same plots you saw before, but with the whole data set now. And, and because this is in print, you can zoom in and see that they're actually made up of the, of the whole data set. So that's what the left-hand side of the page looked like. On the right-hand side of the page, uh, we did this, or I made this program which created these things which I called mobility maps. So what you're seeing here is the mobility map of one individual in the data set who travels back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in just a 2.1 kilometer um, radius. But everybody in that data set has their own mobility map. Everybody in this room has their own mobility map. And what we learned um, through our work was that it was relatively easy to, to given, given a pattern of, of mobility over time, to predict where that person was, was going to be in the future. And that was the um, kind of crux of the science that, that, we were, that we were trying to illustrate. And this is really exciting to me. Uh, you know, it was exciting and then terrifying. Or maybe, I, you know, I don't know when they came, but it was like, because I would sit here with this data and I would know, I would know. The data was anonymized, so I didn't know um, who these people were, but I had the latitude longitude plot. So there's this one person I remember, and they would go to the bar every Friday. I could see that they were, every Friday after work, they would go somewhere. I assume it's the bar, maybe it's not. Um, uh, but because I had the latitude longitude point, I could actually find that bar if I wanted to and show, you know, show up one Friday and really creepily be like, <laughs> I, know where, I know where you work in Lyft, which is what the NSA now does. And, and, um, <laughs> Well, I don't know if they do the last part, but they do the, the, up, the upcoming uh, parts of it. You know, they use these, this data to do exactly that, to have predictive models of how people travel. So, so I did a couple of projects in quick succession after that that investigated this idea. This is one called Just Landed, where I looked at people. Um, uh, I, I had just joined Twitter not too long before. And on Twitter, you get people who tweet uh, this, like, like, like you care. Like, they, they're like, I just landed in London, or I just landed in, in, in they're usually nice places that, that you, they really want to go, um, you know, with these thinly veiled show off tweets. And, and so I thought I could take these because they told me something here. There's a piece of data, it's a measurement, it's, it's where they just arrived. And because these are public profiles, and most of them also tell me where they live, I can plot their, um, their travel. So this is 36 hours of people on Twitter in 2009. Uh, just from people who have said, I've just landed in, or I've just arrived in, or my plane has just landed in, or, and, and, and you know, Twitter has grown in leaps and bounds since then. I, I always think I should redo this project, but I, I never go back to these um, projects because I'm always caught in something new. But it would be interesting to see what that would look like today. And the companion piece to this one, which is uh, um, a lot more fun, this is called Good Morning. This is everybody in the world saying good morning. The, uh, the green dots, you'll see a wave sweep across the globe here, uh, are people who say uh, good morning early, and the red ones are people who, who say good morning later. And so you can, you can get like a profile of laziness across the nation <laughs> if, you, if you want. Uh, 
and then so that brings me to the work that I did at the at the New York Times, and and this is going somewhere. Uh, uh, I worked at the Times as as was uh, said for two and a half years as the data artist in residence. I, I made up that title. I was, obviously, I made up that title. Um, <laughs> I, I, but at the Times, they produce about 7,000 pieces of content every month. It's a lot of content. It's getting more and more and more as they add blogs and add different pieces of the, of the puzzle. And almost each one of those pieces of content gets talked about in social media. You know, it gets talked about in, real, in the real world too, but, too, but the place that we are most interested in was in social media. The question was, like, how, does, how do th does these, these things get shared? How do these things get shared? Well, we know that they get shared from person to person, and that they get shared from like person to person to person to person. Uh, but what we never knew is, is what the mechanics of those lines in between were. And so um, we built a tool, uh, working with Mark Henson at, at the Times, I built a tool called Cascade, which allows us to show this stuff over time. So this is a really simplified version of what Cascade does. It takes these things and puts them on top over, over time as, as visualization. So this would be a really lame conversation. Um, this is what a real conversation looks like. So this is a, a, a cascade for a story called The Island Where People Forgot to Die. So this is the first tweet of the story. All the other pink dots you see are new tweets. All the yellow dots you see stacking up are people who have gone back to the website and read this story. So this is pretty interesting. We can see, um, we can see a lot of, of like about the depth and breadth of, of, of how these diff specific stories are being shared. We can see the people that are in there. Um, but one of the things we can't see in this particular view is we can't see the threads of conversation that kind of branch off and, and, sp and spread. So the tool allows you to sort of toggle between this view and this one, which is called tree view. And tree view gives you uh, this, this kind of architectural view of what a conversation looks like. And this is the, maybe the most exciting thing I've ever seen in my own work, who, seeing this for the first time. Because it opened up our ability to talk about conversations. When Mark and I started the project, our, our vocabulary around conversations was extremely limited. We could say it was a big conversation, or a small one, or a short one, and a long one, and that was basically it. But now we could say this is a branchy conversation, or, or this is a sprawling conversation, or a spiky one. And, and what that allowed us to do is compute on those questions, to say what makes a, a, a conversation spiky? What makes a conversation um, uh, sprawling? And as it turns out, almost every story has its own cascade, and there are certain characteristics. So Nicholas Kristof stories, for example, tend to be low and sprawling, and they tend to last for a very long time, whereas um, public, uh, uh, you know, uh, pol political stories, particularly during elections, tend to be these really spiky ones that don't um, go anywhere. And then there's some, there's some odd ones that come from special events that are unlike most stuff that happens uh, in, in the New York Times. But the key here was like this idea that we could, um, we could ask questions that we'd never asked before because we had a new language. Uh, th there's something about all the work that I've shown you so far that in the, in the last section that, that always bugged me and still bugs me in that um, this work is opportunistic. None of these people whose data I'm using know that I'm using their data. Right, that nobody who was in that just landed thing knew that they were part of my system. Nobody in the good morning knew that they were part of my system. I'm legally allowed to use their data because it's public data, but it still leaves me feeling uncomfortable. It's a weird thing to be using people's data and not having an understanding uh, on their side that that um, is, is, is being used. And, and you know, it's something about this kind of language again. It's like if they had depth, if they, it's this they, you know, it's not if we, it's like you know, if they had um, depth and ingenuity. And this is kind of what's happened is that there's been this they which is built up, which is, um, which is using these types of technology and, and maybe using it without the types of controls that we as a society would, would most, um, most want. Who has is, who is a flashlight app on their phone? Do you know what the number one purpose of a flashlight app is? If somebody said ads, it's not quite. It's to collect your location. So they sell your location data. So when you signed up for your uh, flashlight app, it, either little thing came up and said, you know, is it okay to, this, for this app to use your location? And you probably said yes, because you wanted to find your car keys. Uh, <laughs> But now this company, uh, they, they sell your location data to ad brokers who are going to add it to the profile of what they know about you. Because your ad profile becomes more worthwhile if they know you live in Boulder, Colorado, instead of just in the general Colorado area. It becomes even more worthwhile if they know that you attend this university, and even more worthwhile if they know that you're at Atlas for this talk. So don't turn on your flashlight. 
And, 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 uh, and you know, we, we've been doing a lot of work exploring this, um, this system. We built this visualization, which, which I'm not um, going to show uh, in its full, which shows the entirety of this structure that happens in, in, within about a, a, second, a, a second to two seconds between when you visit an ad and the ads appear. There's an auction that happens around your, your ad placement where these hundreds of people are bidding on, on, on that ad placement. And it's all about how they can get this data to, to, to learn more about you. And that's why they like the flashlight app. Um, uh, there's this, this is amazing to me. And this is, uh, there's this um, uh, new school uh, at New York, in New York um, called CUSP. Uh, uh, which I think has the best of intentions, but they, they, they have this new project called the Urban Observatory Project. And the idea here is they're installing a, a set of the highest definition cameras available on the top of the Empire State Building so that they can use the kind of same techniques that astronomers use, but on the city. And one of the things they're interested in doing is that they can look at everybody's window and they can see if their lights are on and off to measure power usage, which is a great idea, I guess, but... Um, it's kind of this crazy thing that we're going down these roads without having a cover. This is my, my artist's, artist's rendering of, of, of the project. Um, and, and you know, this is why the conversation has become so much more interesting over the last uh, year. Because we can now, uh, maybe thanks to um, this gentleman and, and, and some of the people associated with him, understand a little bit more about this they that, that is um, working in these, these areas and these technologies. You know, and it always leaves me with this question of kind of how did we get here? And three years ago, I was giving a talk in, um, in London. And the guy after me on stage came up and he said this. And everyone cheered. Everybody in the audience was an advertising uh, person. <laughs> you know, and I understand, right? They're thinking about this, which is good, you know. <laughs> You know, but I'm also, th you know, I'm also thinking about this, but in like the context of this, like how amazing it is it that we think this is a good idea to have another oil. Like, one oil is good, right? We can, maybe we don't, maybe we don't need another, um, another oil. And the problem there is, I think, is a, is a lack of understanding of about about what data is. And it comes back to this idea of of if we try to picture this as a resource, as something that we can sort of use in a, in a business context, we're kind of missing the point. These are, these are measurements of real-world systems. And, 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 um, and there's, human, there's this humanity based in these that I think there's a, a lot more interesting things that we can, we can do. So I don't know if you remember this. It happened uh, four, three, and a, three years ago. Um, these researchers found out that there was a file that was sitting on all of your iOS devices, which was storing your cumulative location data. So Apple was doing this because they wanted to make their GPS positioning better. And the way that they were doing that is to record the locations of every Wi-Fi signal in the world. So now they have a location of every Wi-Fi signal. So when you're here, they can read the Wi-Fi names, and they can, tr they can know where you are a little bit better. And so while they were doing that, they were collecting these massive databases of, of location data that were being kept on your phone. So this has caused a huge privacy concern. I think, I think the reasons for that are obvious. Like, I mean, jealous spouse, you know, finds your phone, sees that you're not doing something jealous spouse doesn't like. They murder you horribly. Um, <laughs> Apple gets sued. Apple doesn't like to get sued. So, I mean, I'm assuming they don't like to have their customers being murdered horribly either. But the suing part, I think, is more important. And, <laughs> and so they closed this door quite quickly. But before they closed the door, myself and, and three people that I work with at the New York Times we, we were like, let's get this data, because these people, the researchers, like Lashal Barabashi, who we re, who talked about before, this is gold for them. Like, so let's get this data. And so we started this project, which was mentioned in the opening, called OpenPass.cc. It's still a project that's in a, in a different, I think, better form right now. And what OpenPass allows you to do is it allows you to collect your location data, like every other app on your phone is doing. OpenPass can do it as well. The only difference is that you have, you're the owner of that data. And you get to control how you get, use it. So the simplest way you can use it is you can go to our website. And on the website, you can just see your location data. You can see it over time. You can see it in different, in different um, forms. If you've never done this, it's so much fun. Just like install OpenPass for three weeks and go back and watch that three weeks back. It sounds kind of dry, but it's actually really, you're always like, oh, I forgot I went there. Oh, that's the time I had dinner. It's, like, it's really amazing. It's, it's really personal and, and interesting data. And for us, you know, this was an experiment in something which I believe in really strongly, which I call data ownership. 
the idea that we can put the data that is being produced by people in the hands of, of the of people, and, and sometimes we refer to this as first party access. You know, the conversation around data is about second parties um, and the third parties and sometimes fourth parties, but rarely about the first party, which are the people that are producing the data. And this is where I get a little bit weird and arty, because I'm going to talk about uh, this idea of building a personal relationship with data. So Brian House, who was, who was the um, lead researcher on this project, built these uh, maps, which are maps of what he called his meaningful locations in New York City. So he, saw, he was able to see each meaningful location that he had and, and his pattern of, of movement between those meaningful locations. I did something much more abstract with my data. This is, um, this is uh, uh, I, I keep on forgetting to do this. So this is a clock, um, but, it, but it, the starting of the day is here. And, and then every, these lines that you see, these are cardinal direction lines. So the ones that are up are north, and the ones that you know that reads like a compass. So I uh, I go that way to work in the morning, <laughs> and then uh, and then that's lunchtime, and then I stay at work in the afternoon, and then I you know this is actually when I was starting in New York City, and I kind of went everywhere until like 9 p.m., and then I would come home in some some late night uh, movement here. And the reason for, that I built this was I, had the, I, had, I still have this idea that people might print something like this on their wall, or maybe it's on a, on a flat screen screen. And, and before they went to bed, they would look at it, and they would say, um, good night, data. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, but it's not. In another way, it's not ridiculous. We keep photo albums around our houses. We keep photographs pinned to our fridges. These are the same things that are just in a different form. And... And um, I, I, uh, these, are th these are three of my favorite location points. So there's one. There's another one. There's another one. Yeah, you're, la you're laughing, right? And, and, and this is the reason why this works for the people, for the they, is because we don't care about this. And people can use the, this. So this is um, the, the minute I walked off of the plane at, at LaGuardia Airport. I lived for Van in Vancouver for 27 years. Uh, maybe the most pivotally, pivotally changing moment of my life. Later that afternoon in the evening, I had this Thai noodle dish on Amsterdam Avenue with this glass of Riesling and this spicy Thai noodle dish. I never would have remembered it until I was digging through my location data. And then uh, almost three years ago, uh, I met my girlfriend. We'd been together. She walked down the hallway of my apartment building. That's it right there. <laughs> And I have this idea that, that maybe I, someday I will sit my grandchild on my lap and I'll be like. <laughs> uh, so I have a company called the Office for Creative Research. And our, our idea is to how can we change the way that we think about data and change the way that we engage with data? I think that data in some ways is kind of being treated unfairly in that the only, the only thing that we consider it to be worth doing with is kind of is operating on, can, like computing on, like doing science with, doing business with. But I think there are a lot of other things that we can do that can, that can, first of all, change our societal opinion of data, but also give us new mechanisms that can then, in turn, be useful in these other realms. Um, and something really interesting happens when things become data. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, Shakespeare really, in a deep way, became data thanks to this project called the Monk Project. So the Monk Project takes Shakespeare and it annotates it in really close detail. So in school, I don't know if you remember, you know, we would, you'd take a sentence and you'd say, that's the verb and that's the noun. So that's what this project does with graduate students in Shakespeare. And, it, and it, this is when now what Shakespeare looks like. So every word in Shakespeare is tagged with its part of speech in a really fundamental detail. And what that means is that we can compute on it. And by computing on it, we can do things that we were never able to do before. And so um, we built a project um, called the Shakespeare Machine, which looks, these are all the parts of speech, by the way, that we can, we can, do, we can look at. And it does things like this, where we'll take um, a corpus of, of Shakespeare and we'll look for a specific pattern, in this case, determiner adjective noun. And so determiner adjective noun gives these phrases like this. And these are just like the first uh, like 100 or just a, a random 50 out of thousands that are in Shakespeare that we can pull out that are like this. And they're so beautiful. They carry some of that magic that is what Shakespeare is all about. And so the idea is how can, what happens when we start to read Shakespeare in this way? So what we're doing is we're reading across Shakespeare here. It's all of the 37 plays in the dramatic corpus. And we're reading across it. And, and it's a very different um, way of reading than we're normally um, used to. So this is in New York City. It's a permanent installation in that public theater in Lafayette Street, which is the home to Shakespeare on, on the park. 
and, and it's called the Shakespeare Machine. And each one of these 37 blades of the Shakespeare Machine is, belongs to a certain play. So all the text that appears on this blade might be Hamlet. It's not, but it might be. Um, and, and, then, and then this play is a different one. And we, we play the same games across the corpus to sort of show patterns. So these are all the hyphenated words, which are so beautiful. Shakespeare was one of the first people to really start hyphenating words. So a lot of the ones we use, pig-headed, uh, you know, light-headed, light-hearted, those all come from Shakespeare. He was the first one to sort of wedge those words together. So you can stand under this thing and read it as one, as one piece of, 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 of data. Um, so so uh, this is the kind of work that we do on one side of the coin. So this is a piece that we built in, in the University of Texas in Austin called And That's the Way It Is, which is a dynamic exploration, a live exploration of the nightly news. So what we do is we take the closed captioning broadcasts from TV stations in Austin, and we extract the text, and we play a, a similar type of games um, with them every night. So this piece runs from uh, nightfall to midnight every night, and you play the news back, but in a way which is very different from how we expect the news to be, be being played back. Um, this is my favorite scene where we extract all the questions from the nightly news, and we play them in order, ending with one. And so I love that question. Sometimes it's just like, it's really poignant, why? And other times it's just ridiculous, like, did he find his pants? <laughs> And that's the news, right? Some nights the news is really deep and poignant, and sometimes you're like, and now to a cat stuck in the tree. And, uh, and so this is actually, this is a nice piece, uh, piece of this to show here, because the big news, this is when we were installing, was uh, droughts in Colorado. So withering corn, dry earth, hungry cattle, the drought, um, the, you know, the biggest drought in a generation. The, the, these are the types of things that you see when you stand in front of the piece. It's not really the news itself, but it's like almost like a, a re-dreaming of the news, the way you would experience the news in, in, a, in, a, in a dream later on. So if you're ever in Texas, um, go, and, go and see it. This is a better look at what it looks like. It's 140 feet wide and five stories tall. Uh, I, I only have about ten, ten, five, five to ten more minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, just go through a couple more projects, and then I'll wrap things up in, in a way that I, think, that I think makes sense. You know, the work that we do is to try to think about how do we take a data set where there's some obvious ways to look at it, and how do we look at it differently? So this is every hotel in the world. It's actually not every hotel in the world, but it's close. There's about 600,000 hotels um, all over the world. You see the coastlines, because people like to go to hotels on coastlines and you know, bright islands, because people like islands as well. Um, this is the type of thing that we typically do with the data, but it doesn't tell us anything about a hotel. Like I, stay in, I, mean, I stay in a hotel right now. I stay in a lot of hotels. Hotels are these really weird human experiences. This data set tells you nothing about that weird human experience, but we, one hotel doesn't either. We want to tell the story of every hotel, but tell it in a way that's human. So we built this piece um, which, uh, which uses this, this, this kind of trick which says, um, what would happen if every if characters from um, oh, so this that was just a slideshow of, of of some hotel images. What would happen if characters from major novels like On the Road? What would happen if they were traveling today? And which hotels would they stay in? And so the piece is it was installed at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Uh, it's called In the Room Would Be Good Enough for the Time She Had to Stay. And and I'll play you a little piece of it. This is the characters from Lolita. They're traveling along the eastern seaboard. They're going to stop at one of these towns. And then they're going to use Expedia, to, which they would, to find, um, to find a hotel to stay in, uh, which you'll see in a second um, come up, the kind of awesome hotels that are available at their budget in that place at that time. And, and all, all of the other little, little crosses that you see moving around the map are other characters and other stories. Some of them are, are contemporary stories. Some of them are totally not, like Odysseus is in there as well. Uh, as well as the characters from Lolita and, and on the road and, and, and so on and so on. And so our attempt here, and, and I don't, I'm not sure it's entirely successful, but is to try to think about how can we tell data through stories that, that accept the fact that, da that these data sets are very large, but also get down to the, the sort of human story that's within them. Um, so the last project I'll show you is the most, the most unusual, and maybe the most surprising for you who came to this talk today. Uh, we, we're doing a, a, an artist in residency at the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan, and what we've been working with is we've been working with the um, exhibition uh, collection. 
or the collection. So there are 120,000 pieces in the collection at the Museum of Modern Art. And we did a performance last month, um, which was using only the, the titles of those pieces. So this is a, a, a script that the performers used from the first part of it. These are, these are everything you read here is like every line is a full title of a piece. And so the, um, the, the performers will read a script like this. Um, they also, we also do script, we did some scripts like this, which look at, uh, these are again, full title of a piece. These are words that have the same, uh, they, they're pronounced exactly the same way. If you say those to yourself, uh, the, the stressing and the syllables are exactly the same. Metropolitan, probability, periodicals, equilibrium. This is a different set, which are, I love these ones. Samoan fantasy, Crawford family, Harlem document, Chinese memories. And, and so we had this... Um, the theater troupe, who we work with a lot, called the Elevator Repair Service, come into MoMA and, and, read, and read these uh, plays, or these, these scripts we've written. And a lot on the top was a, was a visualization of what they were reading. And one of the part, what we wanted to get, things we wanted to get out of this was that the museum is not just what you see in the gallery. The museum is this whole other thing, which in some cases is data. It's this, it's this collection of data that, that the personnel of the museum have um, have built over time. And so I'll, I wanted to show you just like the shortest piece of this video that I can. Just so you, it's okay, it's not online. So you get an idea. Girl. Gainsborough girl. Young girl back turned. Girl with a mandolin. Fanny it's really fun working with the actors because they come up with reasons to say that. So these guys are kind of competing. They're like, girl who can read the longer title based on the one that the other person read? Head That's not what we intended at all. But three quarters to left. Ted and bust of a woman. Three quarters to left. Head of a sleeping woman. <laughs> study for nude with drapery. <laughs> Girl. So he's, he's admitted defeat there and gone back, <laughs> gone back to girl. And then they play the game again, and they play this particular game for about five minutes. And I'll, I'm just going to jump randomly to another piece of the video. I don't know what we're going to get, but you'll... Oh. Oh, this is the song that we wrote. Um, ah, forget it. I'll post this so you can watch it later. I'm running out of time, so... Asphalt Magical. Chinese Memory. Joanne Surfacing. Norfolk Cup. Pawnee Villagers. All right, I've got to stop that. I could watch that all, all night, though. Um, you know, and, and, then, and then, so the, uh, the whole reason I, ca I wanted to come here and talk to you guys today is that I think that the data, no matter in what field that you're working in, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to do things differently than the way that we're doing it right now. And I think that that, that is not only a nice opportunity for us, but it's kind of a required opportunity. This is a, a quote from Lashlo Baribashi, which I, I love very much and I always keep in my head. Where, where he says, do you want to stop different transmitted diseases? Do you want to design better cities? Do you want to stop traffic jams? The data to do so is there in private hands, and we need to identify some social consensus by which the data can be shared with the different stakeholders who can take advantage of that. And I think this is like, comes as close to, to, to defining the reason why I do the work that I do as possible. And the focus of our work is really on this idea of social consensus. How do we create that social consensus? And we believe that a, lot, a large part of that is not only doing visualization work in the traditional sense, but also doing these things that involve theater, that involve literature, that involve poetry, that involve all of the forms that over thousands of years have helped us understand very large, ambiguous topics and, and trying to um, put them in, in, into play here. Um, because because I, what I don't want is more of this, because what we have right now is we have this on a larger scale. There are corporations that are out there right now who I won't name by name. I wish I, w I really want to name by name, but I won't. Uh, who are like doing this for the government right now. It, and it's just as bad, and it's just as poorly thought out, and people are believing it for the same reasons that they believe this bullshit. And, 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 and we need to get to a point where, where, where we take some of the danger out of these types of things by, by being smarter about it as, as a society. So I'll leave you there. Um, I'd love for you to get in touch. Twitter, Twitter. Uh, um, uh, this is our website. I'm really easy to find in any, any type of mechanism, and I'd love to talk to you. So thanks. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take questions for a few minutes. I'm sure people have to leave, so if, I, yeah. I have a question for you about ethics. So, yeah. I mean, as, as a scientist, I'm always trying to present my data in a way that's compelling, right? That, that focuses on something that's 
some point that I want to make. Yeah. But it's also honest about the limitations of the data yeah. and of the point that I'm trying to yeah. make. Yeah, yeah. yeah some, I, I heard a really good quote, which were, which were like from anybody. I, I couldn't believe it. it was from Alan Alda the other day, who said that uh, you know we should we should treat science with objectivity, but the communication of science we need to treat with heart and emotion. And and in some cases that's sort of close to what you're saying here. Now I think in our work we we're really careful to not make. The mistake, which is, I think, the biggest mistake you can work with data, and I said this in the, in the beginning, which is like to, to, to lie by saying that you're talking about the thing and not a measurement of the thing. Like We try to be as careful as we can in all of our work to say this is not a visualization of, of you know, all of the, we did a fruit and vegetable project last year, of all the fruit and vegetables coming into to America. It's a visualization of the records that are kept by the Department of Agriculture of all the fruit and vegetables that come into America. And even just by saying that, it opens up different avenues you know, to, to ask questions, to do like, visualizations that are attached to it. So to me, like, that's the most important part. I teach a class right now called Data Art. And, and so it's all about how can an artist have a practice surrounding data, data. And I think one of the defining things that makes data art interesting is that you kind of have to be, you, you, you want to be rigorous with your technique, even though you can be fairly flexible with, your, with, your, with the output. You know, there are some cases where you can break that rule, but you have to be aware that you're breaking that rule, and you have to be able, you have to really understand the decisions you're making there. And I, I, I think I think you're right, you're spot on. That's like the number one problem with working with data, and it becomes doubly interesting when you're dealing with human systems, because the ethics of even using that data is interesting. Like what what is the ethics of people using twi using Twitter for scientific research? Like I, I don't think anybody's ever really unpacked that in a really good way. Because we all know that user agreements are bullshit, right? Like, they are. Nobody reads them. But we st we, we, it's, we're happy to use that scaffold if it serves us, and we're unhappy to use it when it doesn't. You know? and, and, and so we're happy to say, oh, this is fine to use people's data, because they know. Well, they don't know. They don't read the user agreement. And so this, there's a lot of territory that I, I think needs to be, <laughs> that, and these types of discussions, I hope, like, are what are going to start that. In the back? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. I'm... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for some weird reason, we kind of got cut up with text. So I work with two other artists, Ben Rubin and Mark Hansen, and, and they, they've been working for about a decade with text. So people come to us with, with text, but we, we, we're really interested in all kinds of other, uh, of other data sets. We've, we've done a fair amount of work with images, both video and still image, but we haven't done a lot of work with sound as data. But you know, we're really open to everything. It's just like we, we're a small studio. There's only so much work we can do, and the, the, the stuff that tends to come to us is like, we saw your Shakespeare project. Can you do this? We saw your, you know, whatever that other project is. Yeah. Love to talk. Thanks. My first, my favorite five words were, so I built this tool. <laughs> and the question is, up following up what you just said, what can we do to make it possible for everyone to build this tool to visualize yeah. the data that they're interested in? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, as a as a teacher, that's like one of my big goals is to try to like foster. I call it bespoke tool making. Like we're we're focused. Software somehow became really, it became big. Like in we went from like I'm a huge fan of HyperCard, which HyperCard is like my favorite thing in the in the known universe, which is this like tool that was built on the original Macintosh that people would use to author their own small software. So you could make your like a tool to balance your taxes, or to or to like document your kid's basketball team, or to like compile your research about bed bugs, or whatever you wanted to do, and then and that kind of went away as software became commercialized for the first time. But we haven't ever come back to that in a really. I think we're coming back to it with like an, with the open source movement. So I use an open source um, framework called um, Processing, which is a Java um, based toolkit that we use for everything, and that's also part of the thinking behind Processing. And I think that that's one thing that. You know, in, in, in almost every academic discipline, I, I, may, I could make the strong argument that we should be making tool makers out of researchers so that people can make their own tools. Because sometimes the tools we make, we make some that are quite big. We make some that are tiny, like really tiny. Like, 
20 lines of code to process something that, that we just can't do with any other tool. And that's the problem is I think you know, with anything big that's a broad, broad purpose tool, you're always going to hit a wall where you can't do the exact thing you want to do. And then you fall, you fall out of it. But it's a, hard, it's, a hard, it's a hard problem because you do want general purpose tools. They're, you know, I love, I, you know, hey, I like Excel. I like, like, if I need to see data right away, like, hey, I'll graph it in Excel. I'm not ashamed to admit it. But at the same time, like Excel can only do like eight different things in visualization. Whereas with a little bit of with a little bit of programming, no, it's not too much. You can you can get into into that. But yeah, I mean that's tools are my, one of my obsessions. Yeah. So that was part of my question, but I'll follow it up with: so how how do you feel as a when you see somebody copying a visualization that you've done? Yeah, this doesn't happen to me very much, but. Um, I, I have no problem with it at all, really. I have absolutely. The only time that I've ever had a problem with it is, the, is when companies, this, will ha this has happened to me more than, no, it, it, people like just working on their own projects, their personal projects, have done things that are really close to what I've done, and I have no problem with that whatsoever. But when I have a problem with it is like agencies will come to me and say, we want to use your work in this campaign, and I'll say no because I don't want, agree with what they do and what they're working on. And then they'll just go to somebody else and say, can you make something that looks like this? And then they'll use it in the work. And that's pervasive through the design community. And it's more pervasive with the small community that, that I'm kind of a peripheral part of, of this kind of software-based art, where a lot of the times they're not interested in engaging with advertisers, but the advertisers have the money and they have the clients go ahead. And so they'll do it anyways, which is, I have, it's, it's kind of hard to, and I'll answer the question in one different way really quickly is like, so I, everything that I release, I release open source and with, with like a really open, open source license. You know, and part of the purpose of the, you know, the open source philosophy was never in the beginning anti-commercial. You know, I have no problem with people like taking the, the stuff that I release open source and making a, a project from it that makes them money and not sharing it with me. It's kind of part of the deal. But uh, the only type part that I, ha that I don't like about it is when it's kind of nefarious, when... You know, and they don't tell you or they lie to you, and then the project comes out. Hi. What is it that you have like a problem with agencies using this stuff? Like, what is the ethics that you don't like? Like, what are they trying to do? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think that, that, and this is, I'm Canadian, I'll preface that by the, this. Like, I don't think people need to buy a whole lot more shit. So, if the company is like largely in the business of convincing people to buy stuff, I'm not really interested in contributing to that. I don't have like, you know, I'm not going to firebomb their offices, but I also don't want to contribute to it. So we don't do any work for, for um, corporations that, that, that are like, that's their sole purpose. You know, we do, we do work for, for companies, though, like, that, that do sell stuff. But we usually do work on, you know, on, on, on a, we do a lot of R&D work, which, which is like a lot of these companies come to us saying we're, we're interested in, in, in how we could do a better job dealing with our data ethically, or how we could you know, use new tools to gain insights from data. Like we're working with Microsoft, Microsoft, but we're working with their cybercrime center to try to understand how these, these things, these botnets are impacting human systems, which is like, so you know, it's never clean cut. I can't say like, I'm never going to work with anybody who sells things. But on the other hand, like, we, don't, we, we turn down like, most of the work that comes our way. So yeah. Yeah, not at all. That's part of the problem. <clears throat> Policy doesn't really exist for this. So, you know, one of my favorite thinkers around this is a, is a researcher at Microsoft Researcher. Research, her name is Kate Crawford, and she does a lot of writing and thinking around the ethics of big data. So if you're interested in this topic, that's a really good place. And actually, her partner is a, is a lawyer who's, who, who um, his name is Jason Schultz, who works on uh, kind of high-level policy around intellectual prop property. And they've been starting to come up with some possible frameworks of what policy would look like around these things. It's very hard to understand right now, and, but it's kind of exciting because it's a really nascent thing. Like, we don't really know where, where it's going to go, but it, it's also terrifying because I think we're moving so fast that, and, and a lot of these companies you know, that, that I veiledly talked about, they have huge lobbies in the government. So we, there's that problem as well, which is that if and when laws get passed around these things, there's going to be a huge drive by the people whose interest it is to keep, to keep the rules how they are. To keep the rules how they are, it's interesting. Can you say her name again? Kate Crawford. Yeah. Uh, what are we looking at right now? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> So, so then we built this tool I showed it to you earlier that was like a visualization of the ad network. And, and I had this idea of how to visualize it. And I had to have a phone call with somebody. And so I, just wrote, I wrote this quickly to sort of show them what it might look like. So it's nothing right now. It's a good ending slide, though, because people are like, ooh, they're transfixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is, I mean, there's, this, yeah, we, we get into pedantics here. There is data in there, but it's not like a real data of any kind. Uh, I mean, I'll take two more questions. I, I'm starting to lose my. Um, ability to speak. I'll go here and then there. Yeah. So have you ever abandoned a project because you started to feel like, okay, this is no longer about humanizing data mm -hmm. and it's not gonna it's gonna look pretty but it is yeah. gonna be meaningful? Yeah, I mean meaningful is a weird word. I mean I think like a lot of the work that I've done in the past and continue to do maybe doesn't pass like a really high level of meaningful. Sometimes we just do stuff for fun in the studio and I think that's fine. As long as it's not like destructive, I don't. That's the question that we normally ask. And, but, and then we, we abandon projects left, right, and center for all kinds of reasons, mostly because they're terrible. <laughs> and like I, sh I get to show you like all the good stuff that came up, but there's like a mountain of shit that I built that <laughs> that like I would never show you because I'm embarrassed to do so. But you know that's that's the reality of it. Last question, yeah. Well, I mean, so when I started doing this work four years ago, five years ago, that was like a real question. It was hard to find data. Now, like, it's like, A, it's everywhere, and B, people are coming to us. Like, most of the time, people come to us and say, it's funny, because this is like the thing I get most often, like, after a lecture. <laughs> Somebody would be like, I have this great data set. And about four to five times, I'm like, uh, it's not that great. But, but the fifth time, you know, you're like, oh my god, it's amazing. <laughs> And, and so, you know, we're excited, about, we're excited about that stuff. There's so much open data right now. Like, I, the, one thing they did that we went off with, like, nobody talked about it. So the first work that I ever did with data was with the New York Times API, which is um, an interface that allows you to connect your own software to their database. Um, and, and when they released it, it was from 1981 to 2011. 10, 2010, I guess. Yeah, well, 2009. Um, now it goes the whole way back. So it's like 1870s all the way up. It's an amazing data set. And I'm just I'm shocked that like the first time they released it, it got a lot of attention because this was new like for a company to have an API and, for the, and big data was just getting going. This next time they released it, nobody even said anything. But it's, to me, it's, like, it's amazing. I mean, you could spend a year just dealing with that data set. I mean, it's this cultural record that is so fascinating. And one of the questions we ask ourselves, I think the most fundamental question of our, of our sort of company slash art practice slash whatever is like, how, do they, how can databases exist as cultural artifacts? And that one, you hardly have to answer the question. It's like, it's already there. It's just a matter of finding interesting things to do with it. All right, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>